Welcome uh, to our Religion and Praxis podcast, a very special episode uh, for me, since this book is about the, uh, this this episode is about the book, which I was uh, fortunate to edit and collaborate with uh, some of the leading scholars, Christianity Studies and beyond, um, so in the very general question. Can centuries-old religious practices adapt to unprecedented global challenges? As sociologists of religion, my my journey alongside theologians, historians, political scientists, some of them are in the audience with me right now, has led us to untangle how how COVID-19 pandemic has not just reshaped religious practices, but also revealed deep-seated tensions and promoted a critical reassessment of the church's societal role. Our book is not just a book aimed at academic audience, and that's why perhaps it's an open access book. It is a vivid chronicle of resilience, adaptation, and at times counterintuitive relationships between religious faith and public health policy. We ask, in what ways did Orthodox communities across different cultures respond to the pandemic? What do these responses reveal about intersection of faith, culture, and crisis management? From the quiet churches of Finland to vibrant communities of Greece, authors delve into diverse Orthodox responses to this pandemic. The book covers Orthodox churches and their practices in Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Cyprus, Georgia, Serbia, Russia, Finland, and Sweden, and also some of the eparchies of the churches beyond these territories. So does Orthodox Christianity evolve in response to societal changes? How have ancient traditions within the Orthodox Christianity reconciled with the demands of the modern health crisis? The pandemic has been a litmus test for leadership within the church, and the book highlights how religious leaders across different regions have navigated these challenges, sometimes with creativity and ingenuity, reshaping their roles and community worship. Each chapter weaves a unique narrative that reflects broader societal shifts in the face of an unprecedented health emergency. But what does this say about the nature of religion itself? What can the story of Orthodox Church during the pandemic teach us about the role of religion in contemporary society? How does this understanding or understanding this interplay broader our our perspective on global crisis? Whether you're a person of faith, a student of sociology, or simply fascinated by the interplay of global events and religious institutions, Orthodox Christianity and the COVID-19 pandemic invites you to the world often either ignored or understudied in the mainstream academic discussion of religion, the world of Orthodox churches. So we start today by going through the chapters, which um, which are in total eight. We'll start from chapter one, which is written by Tatiana Kalinchenko, Kirill Hovorun, and Timofey Brik. Timofey Brik is here with us. He's a rector of the Kiev School of Economics and uh, the name of the chapter, and he's, of course, a sociologist, which is you know, not less important uh, a measure um, of, of uh, his brilliance, uh, Church Fragmentation and the Pandemic. Analysis of Four Eastern uh, Christian Groups in Ukraine is the name of the title, name of the title of the chapter. And Timofey is here to guide us through the key arguments of, of the chapter. Timofey, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me today, but also, you know, for including our team to this wonderful book. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of a big team. I, I worked with co-authors Tatiana Kalinichenko and uh, Cyril Hovarun on this chapter, where we explored um, the case of Ukraine, which is a very fascinating case, um, since uh, uh, the religious market and I will emphasize this term, which we use in our chapter. Some people would say religious landscape. We use the term religious market on purpose because uh, that's driven by some sociological theories. So this religious market is quite fragmented in Ukraine, even though uh, the orthodoxy uh, dominates uh, in Ukraine, 
the religious landscape is fragmented in different jurisdictions. So historically, Orthodox ch Church is divided in Ukraine, and it is represented by several groups. And we also cover a quite unique and specific group of uh, Greek uh, Catholic Church, which is um, uh, located in western parts of Ukraine, and nevertheless, it has the status of a national intellectual and cultural leader in the eyes of many politicians and Ukrainians who live outside of Western Ukraine. So these churches tend to compete with each other in terms of narratives and in terms of political power. You know, they want to be associated with the status of a national church, and yet none of these churches have necessary power and resources to monopolize religious market. So that's why we use this term fragmentation. But during the pandemic, each church um, adhered to quite specific narratives, how to support their con congregations, but also how to deal with the pressure from the government. Because like in many other countries in Ukraine, uh, the government wanted to implement strict measures, uh, quarantines, uh, they wanted to close uh, public transport, markets, offices. So the question is, what do you do with churches? Do you, do, can you and should you close uh, religious uh, masses during the quarantine? So obviously each Orthodox church independently um, wanted to maintain their um, their masses and gatherings. So all of them kind of challenged the government, but in their own unique way. Only one of these churches, which is the Orthodox uh, Church um, related to uh, Moscow Patriarchate, uh, behaved in a very unique and a bit aggressive way towards the government. They really ch challenged the government in their narratives saying that the government is too oppressive, that the government tries to regulate church. And they also offered um, they, uh, their own narrative of competition. They said that, you know, the government is too weak. They cannot deal with uh, the crisis, but we can. We have our own uh, phone hotlines. We have our own masks. We can support... Uh, uh, doctors, and we can support populations in need. So they also challenged the government as a provider of public goods, which was their way of kind of defending uh, the sphere and saying, like, look, guys, we are in control, so you should not and cannot close our churches because we are uh, proactive actors who care about Ukrainian nation. All other uh, churches... Uh, were more compliant. Uh, they acted in agreement with the government, uh, arguing that you know COVID is a COVID is a very serious, significant issue. It is a um, uh, medical issue, and we have to treat it respectively. So we have to comply to the governmental measures in terms of uh, have, taking distance, uh, sanitizing spaces. Uh, they even offered uh, new rituals, saying that, you know, you can pray at home. You don't have to go to, to church if you don't want to. So other churches were more compliant. Nevertheless, they also um, uh, explored these narratives of cooperation in order to maintain uh, churches open. So basically, the argument was, we, we comply. We are good, nice actors. You can trust us. Uh, so we can deal with pandemic on our own. You you don't need to close the church because we sanitize everything. We keep distance. We are good guys in this story. Uh, so even though we observe quite different narratives from different churches, in the end, all of them aim to sustain uh, traditional uh, uh, rituals, uh, masses, and gatherings. We also see that these narratives, which we analyzed using media, official websites, um, uh, public speeches of uh, religious leaders, we also see that these narratives correlate with uh, public opinion, as we also analyzed public opinion, and we also conducted qualitative interviews with priests. So we see that these large uh, narratives 
correlate with uh, what we observe in behavior of people. So uh, those um, uh, Ukrainians who associated themselves with the uh, Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate indeed were more kind of um, skeptical towards the government and believed that they have to follow the church in navigating through the pandemic. So overall, what we observe is that Orthodox Church in Ukraine uh, was fragmented. Different churches spent quite a lot of time and efforts to maintain their uh, uh, their masses and gatherings. Nevertheless, due to these fragmentations, they challenged the government in a different ways. So the government received uh, you know a lot of pressure from these uh, churches, and. Uh, and what is the conclusion? So interestingly, that you know the, the Ukrainian Orthodoxy uh, actually, I I would say um, uh, achieved what they wanted. They were not closed by the government, and they achieved it through challenging government by uh, these different channels. So they were fragmented, and they challenged government with these different channels. And in the end of the day, they achieved what they wanted. So this fragmentation, on the one hand does not allow any particular church to be dominant, to monopolize. At the same time, this fragmentation helps them to um, kind of bombard the government from different angles and from different perspectives to achieve the same shared um, goals. Excellent. Thank you very much. And that, of course, brings the questions about you know what, what happens to churches now when we have this division within um, orthodoxy uh, between the Russian Orthodox Church and Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate on the one hand and the Orthodox Church of Ukraine on the other and the kind of ecumenical patriarchate, uh, you know, together with the Orthodox Church of Ukraine and also this canonical disputes and their kind of geopolitical implications. These are open, open, open questions uh, indeed. Uh, the next chapter is chapter two. Um, unfortunately, uh, Lucian Leustin cannot be with us uh, today. Uh, Lucian Leustin is a reader in politics and international relations at Aston University, and he's one of the uh, main um, widely cited uh, scholars in Orthodox Christianity. In Chapter 2, Lucian Leustin explores the functions and actions of um, Orthodox churches in Romania and Bulgaria during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, demonstrating their crucial roles in shaping public compliance with national health measures. This is, again, um, the, the main theme of our, our, our book. Pretty much we scrutinize through institutional and uh, ethnographic research the function of religion in times of crisis and the responses of, of religion. Through uh, Leustian's analysis, the readers uh, witness the intriguing and diverse responses of the two Orthodox churches under crisis. The Romanian Orthodox Church's division is particularly interesting. The schism between its formal structures and, and uh, informal power networks unintentionally provided fertile ground for the growth of the far-right movement and those of you interested in the populist um, uh, hijacking of religion, especially this 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 uh, chapter is interesting. The situation showcases a church grappling with internal politics, which reverberates beyond its walls into the wider sociopolitical landscape. On the other hand, the Bulgarian Orthodox Church aligning itself more with government's directives supported public health measures enacted to curb uh, the spread of the virus. And that seemingly unified stance, however, was not free of controversy as it faced significant pushback from political protests, notably those linked to anti-vaccination campaigns, yet again echoing the broader context of the anti-vaccination campaigns and conspiracy theories around vaccines. These actions underscore the uh, potential pitfalls and societal discord that can arise when religious and health directives intersect and when public sentiment is divided. Despite these controversies and internal challenges, both churches managed to maintain a high level of public trust, often surpassing confidence in the government and military. This phenomenon attests to the enduring societal influence and the moral authority these religious institutions wield despite the ongoing um, crisis. However, a critical issue in Leustian's uh, chapter and what, what, what is being raised 
is the ambiguous stance taken by the churches on health measures and vaccines during the pandemic and this uncertainty, according to Lucian Leustian's chapter, could potentially undermine effective public health strategies, casting a shadow over um, the role of um, uh, religious institutions in shaping public health perceptions. So a lot of themes which are, again, um, both timely and, and, and relevant and um, uh, we move to the next chapter, which is by Professor Vasilios Makridis and Eleni Sotirol. And uh, we have here the, the the author himself. So, Professor Makridis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tolmike. Greetings to everybody and congratulations for this, uh, I think, quite important book. There has been a legion of publications in the last two years about the COVID-19 pandemic, also the Orthodox, actually. But I think the, your book stands out. Uh, in terms of the quality and also the breadth of its scope. So in, in our chapter, uh, written with, I wrote the chapter with uh, Eleni Sutirio, so we focused on uh, Greek Orthodoxy in the broader sense of the work, focus especially on the Orthodox Church of Greece and also of Cyprus, uh, with some occasional references to the Patriarchate of Constantinople. So the Greek Orthodoxy, uh, to how did it react towards the pandemic. Of course, uh, the size and the respective socio-political context of these uh, churches are not identical. Uh, the Church of Cyprus is much smaller than the Church of Greece. However, there are a lot of common elements, not only in terms of language, history, and political interest, but also in terms of religion. There is also a constant communication between them. Uh, and actually, one of the radical bishops in Cyprus uh, who actually reacted also against vaccination, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, he was a very popular figure among the uh, vaccination opponents in Greece as well, so that the official Church of Greece actually asked the Church of Cyprus to to admonish him to just to uh, be a bit more silent regarding all these issues because he was creating, so to say, trans-Orthodox problems. So uh, our procedure in examining this issue in the chapter was as follows. First, we examine, we we took, it, we tried to put some order into the main problems and the contested issues chronologically as they appear unfolding during the crisis. And actually, we are talking about a crisis which was a pandemic which was quite polymorphous. Let's say in the beginning, in the year 2000, the issue, for example, for Orthodox Christians was more or less the obligatory or not use of face masks. But later on, a year later, the whole issue revolved around the legitimacy of the vaccination and all the, the conspiracy theories connected to it. So we have quite many issues. So we try to put some order in that and also focusing on the attitudes, responses and reactions, of course, selective ones, because we are talking about a huge topic. And uh, what we observe about the official church discourse, but also individual authors, and there was quite a plurality of views. I mean, one could not really uh, find, so to say, what is the, orth the orthodox position of the issue. I mean, we're talking about not only ambiguous, but sometimes quite contradictory views expressed by the same bishops, metropolis of the same church. Uh, so this issue, just to put them in, uh, to, to mention the titles of it, First of all, we're talking about all this conspiracy mentality and theories and their orthodox twists, their orthodox versions. Uh, a second issue was the outbreak of the pandemic as fake news. I mean, it was considered to be, let's say, the COVID like a mere flu. It was nothing else, which was also mentioned that, uh, that the church should not take any measures, I guess, because it's something that happens every year or so. The third point was the lockdown and the restriction measures, which were interpreted as something against orthodoxy, closing the church, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the fourth issue was the uh, digitalization and the virtualization of church life, which was affected. Uh, I mean, that was a phenomenon that we can observe even before, but let's say it was accentuated during the pandemic. And this was considered to be, again, part of this plot to alienate the mode of existence of Orthodox Christians, especially because Orthodox Christianity plays so much emphasis on embodied religion. Uh, a, fourth, a fifth issue was the protection measures in the broad sense, which were considered ambiguously because um, many uh, Orthodox uh, thought that these measures are to totally unnecessary in the abode of God, the, the church building. 
So we don't need any measures because we are under the protection of God. So this was also a conflictual issue. Another related issue was the use of face masks, which was considered again as uh, an element that uh, breaks the normal uh, ritual life because one cannot kiss an icon with a face mask, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the contactless worship, which was connected also to the issue of digitalization of worship. And the last two also controversial issue was the issue of, as we all know, the issue of Holy Communion and then of vaccination. So this was more or less the order that we put. These were the, the main issues contested during this um, pandemic. And of course, we can, we, cannot, we can observe them also in other Orthodox choices. And in the second part, we tried to examine the implications of this pandemic on lived Orthodoxy by making a small scale and small scale field work, also interviews via Zoom, uh, uh, mostly in Greece, and to, to to see how, let's say, believers at the grassroots level reacted towards this pandemic. And so uh, we used here a theory that uh, we found quite uh, uh, pertinent to explain this. It comes from a sociologist, uh, Anri Lefebvre, the rhythm analysis, who actually argues that was one of his major contributions that uh, society is made up of such different clusters of routinized and repetitive behavior patterns. And these patterns can be analyzed as rhythms. And uh, in this way, we can also highlight the interconnection between time and space and how they are, uh, this dynamically may produce different categories in the life worlds of people. Uh, in this context, we concentrate especially on the phenomenon of ritual arrhythmia, which appears also in the title of our book, which actually has to do with this disruption of ritual life, but also with ritual transformation and innovation. Uh, actually, if we talk about Orthodox worship, of course, it has a rhythmic character. And our research has revealed that during the pandemic, uh, there was a breakdown of the usual time-space structures of religious experience. And all this had uh, dramatic effects on the life of uh, Orthodox believers. Uh, in other words, the criticism that were voiced by our interlocutors, I mean, they reflected their need to reclaim the rhythm of ritual life and also to resist the silence uh, that uh, might have resulted in the complete annihilation of their Orthodox identity. Now, what is interesting here, this arrhythmia, of course, is symptomatic of a pathology that creates uncertainty and also has unsettling and disturbing effects. But what is interesting, this is one side of the coin. Let's say that during the pandemic, this ritual arrhythmia produced a crisis of the collective Orthodox identity. This is true. On the other hand, what is quite uh, worth mentioning is that it also allowed for agency and strategies of adaptation and innovation. So that's the other side in Orthodox rituals and beliefs and practices. Uh, so the end result of ritual arrhythmia was not only this disruption, but also uh, was a multitude of religious responses and practices, both on the level sometimes of the official church, but also of the laity. Uh, in other words, people try to find new ways of creating new rituals or adapting existing rituals to the conditions of the pandemic. Let's say in the context of the domestic church, also uh, in the house as the main the house church is the main locus of worship. Also, the role of women, let's say the gender issue was particularly important here because women appear to be protagonists in this new ritual invention and demonstrated some, let's say, novel religious expertise, which, let's say, old hierarchies in the church find uh, found a bit more upsetting. Uh, also, the fact that, let's say, digitalization created also in this context different other uh, 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 other effects, for example, the sacral individualism and also sacral communitarianism. In other words, people were, in a way, uh, individual believers and practitioners, but at the same time, through the digital communication, they created a sacral digital community with other Orthodox Christians across the globe, during Easter, for example. So uh, we focused on the second aspect to show also the dimension of lived religion, which was actually uh, something that you pointed out in the beginning of the conception of your book. So by combining these two strands of research, 
an analysis of Orthodox discourses and events, juxtaposed with ethnographic uh, data on religious practice, we attempted to provide a more holistic picture of the Greek Orthodoxy towards the pandemic. Which you excellently did, and and a great, great um, uh, interest, of course, uh, I'm sure from our readers, and uh, conspiracies, anxieties, and ritual arrhythmia, exploring Orthodox discourses and practices in Greece and Cyprus during the corona pandemic. That's the name of the chapter. Please read that. And thanks to St. Gallen, this uh, this 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 happened to be a collaborative project between all of us. And thanks to the Lund University's uh, Library Fund, this is an open access, which gives our listeners and readers uh, free access to this book. And so um, you're more than welcome to download it and uh, reshare it extensively. So um, thanks a lot, uh, Vasilios. And uh, next chapter is mine, titled As If uh, the State Matter, Georgian Orthodox Church under the COVID uh, crisis here. I look at essentially two um, um, aspects of church-state relationships. One is the institutional, formal, and the other is more informal. And an extremely important um, aspect, of course, to understand the Orthodox Christianity in Georgia is to look at the, uh, the, the historical role that the church plays and the legal arrangement that it managed to have with the state. That puts Georgian church into a very superior position um, compared to other churches. And during the pandemic, it also gave the church a very um, kind of a green card, a kind of a special uh, status within the polity where churches could have done basically anything uh, and almost uh, uh, anything defying the major um, health measures adopted by the government. Um, and still there was um, no necessarily correlative kind of punitive um, um, aspect from the state. Quite the opposite, actually. The state was very much looking into uh, and one might say appeasement of the church uh, because it was very politically salient. And the ch- churches later emerged into the practices which uh, me and my uh, uh, friend Timothy Brick in other paper called performative security. To uh, Performative security refers to the manner in which Orthodox uh, Church created uh, the illusion of security by mimicking security measures through the repetition of certain narratives and rituals, special prayers against COVID and etc. But the, the 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 real deal was that the church was faced by the state, which uh, was ruled by the politicians who were concerned a lot by the political implications of this crisis, um, and it manifested through different legal and financial arrangements with the church, uh, but also um, a, a number of um, uh, rhetorical uh, and discursive um, aspects, which are discussed uh, in in details uh, in, in the book. Um, uh, interesting, of course, will be uh, for for many uh, readers to look at the uh, role of Christ of church uh, in times of crisis. How the church uh, functioned uh, in terms of mourning and grief, and also the effect of the church in times of uh, the COVID pandemic. So the the chapter has interviews with the uh, clerics, the priests who were dealing with uh, the, the the grief, but also analysis of the institutional uh, setup, which um, I briefly discussed. And there was a clash on different levels within the within the political elites. Of course, the more like scientifically driven politicians we're arguing that every rule shall be applied the similar way to all the major proxies and agents and actors including the church while the others were more um, um you know into the pragmatic considerations whether and to what extent that could have led the the deterioration between the church and state relations so i try to track and process trace that through different examining different legal initiatives by the government different responses of the church and public reaction. Public reaction also varied, but to a large extent, Georgians um, agreed to uh, uh, play by the rules established by the government. And uh, these were very draconian rules. These were really um, very strict measures. And, uh, you know, uh, from from uh, like kind of a classics of the very much restrictive pandemic rules that we all want to forget. So Georgia lived through that. Um, but but interestingly, when the big rituals like Easter and Christmas came, the church has, uh, again, as we discussed briefly with uh, Timothy in another paper, performative security. So imagine the situation where the parishioners were allowed to go into the churches and use the same spoon for communion, but not violate the rules of the state because they were not out of the church. Uh, after basically the uh, it was illegal to get out. So imagine a bunch of people in the same proximity of the same uh, religious uh, 
uh, place and of the church closed using the same spoon with the same ritual overnight and then getting out next morning from the same church. And, and the, 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 there is no vaccine at the time, so there is a pretty high risk of contain, contention. Some ministers of the Georgian government um, uh, recorded publicly uh, being on record and being, um, uh, you know, arguing that that doesn't spread the virus. So I'm detect- I'm also delving into the kind of controversies from the political uh, politicians and their responses, individual responses to this um, crisis, but also the implications generally, and then the vaccination um, rates and the, to what extent that kind of contributed in general uh, to these conspiracies about against the vaccines, as uh, Vasilios mentioned, um, and to what extent the consequences were um, adequate to the responses of the of the pandemic. This is more or less uh, my quick uh, summary of what's going on in Georgia. And the next chapter we have uh, from Serbia, um, and Stefan Radojkovic is uh, here as a political uh, scientist, historian, and a good friend um, and uh, from, from the University of uh, Belgrade. Uh, his chapter is named the COVID-19 and Orthodox Christianity, Communion Practices in Serbian Orthodox Church. So, Stefan, please, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Karim. Uh, thank you all for uh, making this book possible. Uh, so, basically, my um, goal was to do the field work to see what is going on on the grassroots level. And uh, my first, and I will start with this, well, it's not an anecdote, but it was my first field uh, trip during the Easter land of uh, 2020, 2021. Yes, uh, and it was in Monastery Rechanica in Kosovo, Metohija. So, and I went there to the liturgy and in front of the uh, main gate at the monastery, there was a, a clear time timeline when the uh, liturgies, Sunday liturgies are uh, old. And I was there, let's say, around 8.30 a.m. Uh, by the time that I got to the, to the monastery with a friend, the liturgy was all but over. So that was unexpected uh, uh, finding for me, at least, at that the time. And during the, the research process, I was talking with the, one of the uh, most influential journalists here in Serbia and in the region, uh, Jelena Rogacevic. And I, and I asked her, uh, was she familiar uh, with this kind of practice, actually? And she confirmed that she know, knew quite a bit of priests in Belgrade and in uh, Montenegro that uh, used a similar tactics uh, to somehow manage the crowd in the in the churches during the Sunday liturgies. So basically, they would uh, uh, give a false uh, information, uh, public information. But for those uh, believers and practitioners of orthodoxy in Belgrade and other places in Serbia that were uh, uh, very well established within this uh, particular community, they would get the, they would know the, the the proper information that the liturgy would start way earlier, so that there would be no, uh, um, uh, how to say, uh, huge amount of people, uh, huge number of people inside the church, and especially during the uh, the Holy Communion. So <clears throat> then, uh, when I was going to the to the media outlets, uh, there was a one can say a unanimous conclusion that basically if one uh, is searching for the official stance of Serbian Orthodox Church on the pandemic, uh, that person could not find one official. Every bishop was basically uh, for itself, and there was also the, the some public statements of the synod as well. And uh, most of them, some of them were more conservative, uh, but none of them, as I could uh, tell from the from my data, that no one uh, denied the existence of uh, virus, but they offered, and also they, uh, all of them uh, recommended that uh, religious practices uh, or, or the recommendations by this, uh, promulgated by the state are respected, but also that the church life and the liturgies must continue as well. So basically, they were trying to walk this narrow line, this narrow path between the need for uh, 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 health restrictions during that period, and also to con- continue with the uh, with the religious and uh, spiritual life uh, as nothing was happening actually. So uh, then we have, like, for example, the Bishop of Bačka, Irine. He also uh, he uh, offered even the little publication that was on that kind of that used that kind of uh, argumentation. So I wanted to see how that. Um, how all of these mixed messages from the state, from different bishops, 
and then from different uh, legal and social contexts of Serbia and Montenegro, and especially in Kosovo Metohija, where the legal situation is, is even more complex than in Montenegro, for instance, how these kind of recommendations, um, uh, advices, uh, stances, and policies uh, were affecting the, the uh, receiving the Holy Communion uh, in in the everyday life on the, in, in the particular churches. So I, I went to the monastery of Chanica, and also I do the two field research uh, trips to uh, in uh, to Belgrade uh, local churches. One is a graveyard church, and one is the classical parish church downtown Belgrade. And this graveyard church is a little bit specific because it's on the outskirts of the of the Belgrade, and it has a rather interesting interesting congregation there of, of believers. So. The conclusion for Montenegro, for uh, Serbia, and especially for Kosovo and Metohija, there were adaptations. There were also the uh, respect for the uh, recommendations uh, of the authorities uh, at that time. And also there were defiance uh, against all of these recommendations. So that those were like the three large groups uh, of uh, believers of Serbian Orthodox Church and their kind of behavior. And for, for me, the most interesting ones were those of adaptations. And so there were clear signs that they, uh, some of the churches used uh, sound systems so that uh, believers during the, the peak of pandemic uh, were uh, uh, in front of the church, actually. So in one village in Kosovo Metohija, for example, also one of the adaptations was that uh, in Gorazdovac village in Metohija, the, because of the restrictions of number of people at one particular place, they uh, devised, with, in, uh, in agreement with the local priest, they devised this kind of strategy. So there would be like five persons inside the church, five persons uh, in front of the church, uh, five persons on the right side, and also on the left side. So, but, uh, and also, priests uh, ask them to keep the number of people as minimal as possible. Of course, he will not deny them the Holy Communion, he will not deny them the the, the attend to attend, but they need to attend it in a particular way. So because he he, he could have uh, uh, serious repercussions by the Christian administration as well as Serbian government, because all of them were promulgating their recommendations simultaneously. So by the comparison, you have Kosovo's Mitrovica, so the urban area of Serbs in Kosovo Metohija, and uh, uh, despite the recommendations of even of the uh, local bishop. Who was very explicit uh, uh, for uh, for the need to uh, respect all the recommendations of all the inst- in, in, of all institutions in Kosovo Metohija. In Kosovo Skamitrica, no one actually obeyed those recommendations. So you have even that kind of uh, behavior. Uh, also, when when I was talking with the parishioners from the Belgrade Church, they all pointed out to the different way is that uh, some priests in Belgrade or in some other places in Serbia administered Holy Communion. So some of them used the plastic spoons, some of them even tried to pour Holy Communion from certain height, so to say. Uh, even one uh, uh, parishioner of this Belgrade church, uh, the Church of Transfiguration, wanted to uh, uh, use for the safekeeping of this plastic spoon that uh, was used during one of the communities in one of the monasteries within the central part of Serbia as a as a uh, souvenir, actually. So lots of different uh, things happened simultaneously, and my, my argument is that it was uh, partially, uh, uh, how to say, uh, structured because of the policies of the institutions, the state institutions of, of Serbia and Montenegro. It was because of the stances of the bishops, but ultimately it went down to the local priests and believers who managed to navigate this very tumultuous period uh, of uh, life in Serbia, Montenegro, and especially Kosovo. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. COVID-19 in Orthodox Christianity, Communion Practices in Serbian Orthodox Church is the name of the chapter, chapter 5. We have uh, chapter 6, uh, where Maria Toropova, who is not today with us, uh, uh, delves into the adaptation of the Russian Orthodox Church to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the post-Soviet Russia, as uh, Maria argues, where being Orthodox intertwines with national identity, there are distinct categories of Orthodoxy, private, civil, and deep-rooted. Despite the um, tensions between these ideal types, the Russian Orthodox Church 
managed to alter its operations amidst the crisis. However, uh, the pandemic also brought uh, latent contradictions within the Russian uh, church to the light. It revealed a significant leadership gap perceived as uh, the church distancing itself from crisis management, intensifying pre-existing tensions between the church, the state, and society. The pandemic also uh, pushed the church towards online practices. This is yet another interesting uh, pattern, right? Some Orthodox churches were more resistant to online practices, such as Georgian Orthodox Church, for example. Others were not. And this 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 push marked the shift from individual to collective religious experience, and this transition points towards a widening chasm between those who are culturally orthodox and those truly religious, signaling the potential secularization of the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, in addition, the uh, pandemic-related struggles revealed a profound internal discord within the church, a sense of Abandonment pervaded among the um, clergy tasked with managing the crisis on the ground, hinting at possible long-term implications for the church. And of course, the questions about the you know the unity of the Russian church uh, prevailed. The questions both during the pandemic and after, and especially now when the um, in times of the Russian invasion of of Ukraine, these questions are particularly uh, relevant and timely. So the structure of the Russian Orthodox Church is, is widely discussed in the chapter and the and institutional as well as grassroots responses. And a sense of, um, again, this chapter concludes with a pro profound ex exploration of how the church gained and lost parishioners, supported government policies and what choices the, the, the clergy really had. And so fluctuating popularity in its leadership, especially the patriarch Kirill uh, in times of the pandemic. So yet again, this is a very interesting chapter. If you are interested in mapping the you know the global pandemic and the and in the Russian Orthodox Church, the next chapter um, written by myself and um, Timothy is called "Shots of um, Faith: The Influence of Christian Nationalism on Vaccination Behavior in Ukraine, Georgia, Serbia, Montenegro during the COVID." 19 pandemic. Maybe we can do both to partly summarize. You can start uh, from the your part of the argument, and maybe I will kind of wrap it up. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is a quite an um, interesting uh, chapter, which stands out from other chapters in the book. Uh, most of the chapters have described what happened in countries during the pandemic. And the idea of this chapter was to conduct a piloting study a pilot survey to investigate uh, a new emerging uh, phenomenon, uh, which is addressed in mostly international and Western scholarship uh, about uh, Christian nationalism. And Christian nationalism is a quite a specific term which emerged in the United States to describe this amalgamation of uh, nationalistic ideology and religious ideology, meaning that some people tend to um, combine uh, these worldviews and believe that the fate of the nation depends on God, or that maybe God has some specific purpose uh, for uh, domination of your government and your nation. Yeah? Um, in the context of United States, um, uh, many papers, uh, research papers showed that this specific index of Christian uh, nationalism correlates with electoral behavior, with uh, anti-vaccination attitudes, with uh, anti-scientific worldviews. Um, our paper is an uh, exploration of this new topic. We understand that you cannot simply copy-paste and apply this uh, uh, concept of Christian nationalism in, in Ukraine, Georgia, Montenegro. We want to be very careful uh, in analyzing this concept. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, we uh, applied quite similar methodology. We conducted surveys, online surveys, asking uh, our respondents um, about their attitudes towards the government and towards the God using the same items as in previous American studies. And the first step was to collect uh, an online uh, sample uh, in a few countries in Georgia, in Montenegro, in Serbia, in Ukraine. The samples were not large, uh, from 50 to 70 people. Uh, nevertheless, these uh, samples are quite common for pilots. 
Uh, we also uh, investigated the quality of the measurement, the quality of the index itself. Uh, I don't want to bore you know, our listeners with uh, statistical uh, technicalities, uh, but basically the index was quite well enough to work with. Uh, and then we also conducted another study on a larger scale. We uh, surveyed more. We surveyed about one thousand Ukrainians uh, just to see whether our findings can be replicated on a larger sample. And what we discovered the the pattern uh, which we saw in our data was quite similar to the patterns that we observed previously in the scholarship from the U.S. So the there is a statistical correlation. Those people who have this amalgamation of religiosity and nationalism, they also tend to have anti-vaccination attitudes. The statistical association is quite strong. So uh, empirically, it seems to be a universal phenomenon across different countries and cultures that amalgamation of religion and nationalism correlates with this skepticism towards science and government and vaccinations. Nevertheless, uh, theoretically, I think we should do more work to conceptualize uh, the data which we observe, uh, and we have to be very careful and um, uh, not to fall in the trap of simply, you know, copy pasting uh, concepts from uh, one scholarship and simply applying them to the context of um, uh, of, of new societies, of the society that we study. So uh, I think uh, that's it. And Torniki, if you if you want to uh, pick up from this. Yeah, literally like a, a few sentences. I think Dimofi did a great job. The results uncovered a, a link between Christian nationalism. Again, we, we were very careful with, uh, you know, operationalization. What does it mean? A merge of national and Christian identities. Let's put it this way. Um, the, the, the link is notable between the, the, the Christian nationalism and vaccination behavior, even when accounting for factors like gender and social status. Nevertheless, this relationship wasn't uniform, as, as, as you said, across the case studies. The influence of Christian nationalism on vaccination was less pronounced in Ukraine and Georgia, while it were more considerable in Serbia and Montenegro. The findings also highlighted that a strong sense of religious commitment to national identification usually promotes um, a private vaccination behavior, positive vaccination behavior, sorry. And the, the chapter also demonstrated how a COVID-19 pandemic in, in instigated and transition towards digital worship practices. Despite initial resistance, the shift evolved into a critical connection and um, outreach tools, particularly for younger demographic. However, it simultaneously brought into the question of the authenticity of religious traditions in the era, again, of, of, of necessary change. The pandemic highlighted an ambiguous attitude towards vaccination within Orthodox Christian communities, as Dimofi said, um, while individual religious devotion and national identity typically encouraged vaccination, their fusion in form of Christian nationalism actually led to contradicting and inconsistent uh, responses. This is more or less um, where we uh, finished. Again, we're very careful with generalizations and we're very careful with sort of the global appeal of the chapter. It's a pilot study and we're really clear in that kind of emphasizing it in the methodology part. Um, testing um, the, the 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 index also as as Dima briefly mentioned, and the last chapter um, before we conclude is uh, called "Locked Doors: uh, Slam Against the Very Essence of the Church." Finnish and Swedish Orthodox priest pastoral responses to the COVID nineteen pandemic by Johan Bastubaka, um, uh, where Johan delves into the responses of the churches in Finland and Sweden, as you've obviously guessed. The chapter explores how unique institutional structures and varying influences, including state connections in Finland and immigration-induced diversity in Sweden, shape these reactions. And we have to you know, contextualize the relationship between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Finnish Orthodox Church in, 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 in Finland, a kind of historical uh, uh, context. Of, of these relationships, but and, and also the minority status of the Orthodox Christianity in, in Sweden, but also a divergent responses of the Swedish state and Finnish state towards pandemic, right? Sweden was one of the open countries. It didn't have the lockdown and the attitude obviously was slightly different. And, uh, and, and amidst the social uh, pressures, 
faith-related challenges, and state health directives, Orthodox priests assumed a pivotal role, as Johann's paper shows, balancing the preservation of religious traditions with adherence to public health measures. Key actions undertaken by these priests included modifying liturgical practices to ensure safety, such as reducing attendees and modifying sacraments, and providing practical assistance like delivering medications to remote parishioners and etc. Simultaneously, they maintained their spiritual guidance role, um, engaging in theological dialogues about the virus and managing a range of conspiracy theories within their congregation. So actually, this is another interesting divergence from other cases. Um, uh, this balancing act often in the face of personal and familial health risks showcased their resilience, adaptability, and sense of duty, argues um, uh, the chapter. Um, Johan also argues that the pandemic, while present, um, while um, uh, medical, epistemological, political, and logistical challenges also spurred deep theological introspection with Orthodox um, uh, communities. The crisis sparked debates on issues such as anthropology of sickness, the relationship between medical science and theology, and the redefinition of priestly identity in the context of a liturgical emergency. This is the question, again, kind of um, pertaining in the book, the function of the cleric in times of crisis. It also propelled changes in religious practices, reshaping pastoral counseling, communication, and community bonds. So the COVID crisis did not just disrupt Orthodox practices, but it also triggered their evolution to meet the challenges posed by the pandemic. Um, so um, the I think the important part will be to finish with with sort of the broader questions. If if, if what what questions does this uh, uh, the book uh, raises, and what are the relevant questions? I'll go probably around again, and uh, then we can summarize the the whole evening. So what are the pertaining questions that this book makes us think? Um, your thoughts? Maybe we we'll start from uh, Vasilius. Uh, there are many things that uh, one could uh, perhaps pinpoint uh, from this book. I think uh, what is important is to understand this dialectics between this orthodox inflexibility and also readiness to change. I mean, also today's presentation, but also the chapters of the book, they point to this, let's say, conundrum in orthodox Christianity, which has been often criticized as being very uh, traditionalistic and very fixed to tradition that does not change. It's also, let's say, from outside perspectives. And of course, we can see that, let's say, in the Greek case, in the Cypriot case, for example, the church was uncompromising regarding the distribution of Holy Communion, while other churches, also, let's say, the Greek Archbishop in the United States, they were much more flexible. Uh, on this. Uh, of course, they earned criticism from different sides, but in any case, sometimes we see, we don't see the complete picture of orthodoxy. And uh, I would like especially to emphasize what I mentioned also before, that at the level of the lived religion, there we can see that religion, the ways in which orthodoxy is enacted, performed, and embodied, I mean, they change a lot, and perhaps these changes are not discernible. Uh, as uh, as we would like them uh, to be in order to have a more complete picture of orthodox christianity and its uh, uh, and its um, uh, fixation to tradition according to several discourses so i think that's why we put in our chapter with elen uh, sotiri we put more emphasis on this uh, also not only the analysis of the discourses but also uh, on the on this level of lived religion, which actually shows how innovative uh, some ca sometimes uh, traditional uh, religions can be, and also the actors that are involved in this uh, are not only characterized by this tradition boundedness, but they are also able to innovate. Uh, but of course, we don't know if these changes will endure in the post-pandemic era. Uh, but in any case, we see that if we take an actor-oriented perspective, we can see a lot of changes taking place at the grassroots levels. And this is, I think, it's one, uh, we can see this in different chapters of the book, and I, I think this is one of its major contributions. 
Thank you very much. Um, Timothy? Yeah, I really liked what um, was just said about the innovation of um, uh, orthodoxy from, you know, uh, adopting some adapting online liturgies, which happened in Ukraine and some other countries which we investigated. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a very interesting point that our readers will enjoy uh, reading about. Uh, from the kind of larger uh, uh, academic perspective, I also want to emphasize one note, um, uh, which is going to be a bit nerdy, and maybe not all uh, listeners will appreciate it, but I, as sociologist and sociologist of religion, uh, I really like it in our book, and I really appreciate the point that we addressed um, interaction between narratives, organizations, and larger context. Uh, it was just said uh, before that the Orthodox uh, Church uh, in the United States uh, behave somehow differently from the Orthodox Church in Greece and in Ukraine. We even observe variation within one country uh, because we see this interplay between actors and how they make decision based on the context. And uh, I think this is a beautiful sociological story here. And it's just nice to see, you know, uh, our countries to be included in one book and described using this nice uh, sociological narrative. So if you love sociology, please read this book and just enjoy this story. Great, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Timothy. Stefan? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you all uh, for your uh, insights and inputs. And I would like to emphasize three things for me, which were most interesting. Uh, first of all, it's the concept of uh, Christian nationalism and the results of your respective research uh, and findings. So for me, it was interesting that you, as I understood, uh, 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 discovered that basically those people who are authentically Christian are more prone to get vaccinated, as well those who are uh, not mixing nationalism with uh, uh, religion. They're also more prone to getting vaccinated. Well, when there is the amalgamation of these two ideologies, let's say, then the, there is the negative uh, attitude towards the uh, vaccination, if I understood uh, correctly your findings. So for me, that was quite interesting. And uh, it reminded me of the, of the conference in, in Lund, uh, where the, our colleague from Netherlands, some, uh, he had some similar remarks uh, regarding the, the um, uh, Dutch uh, believers, those who are more authentic, authentic believers, let's say, they don't tend to vote for the populist parties, but those who are newly newly religious uh, uh, persons in, and new into this whole uh, field of religion, they tend to vote populist parties, and we see now the, the victory of, uh, uh, parliamentary victory, election victory of Gerd Wilms. So for me, that is somehow very important uh, finding. Also, I would like to stress that uh, uh, for me, it's very important that the religious people uh, and the actors are not just a mere recipient of, uh, of modernist uh, of modernization and its benefits, but uh, active in it and engaged in, in uh, all sorts of uh, discussions and how to use all of these benefits of modernization. For me, that was a, a very important finding, and also that, uh, as I can understand, uh, that. Uh, uh, religious institutions are not monolithic as we can, uh, as some uh, people could perceive them from uh, from uh, outside, and that more research is needed on the grassroots level. So that would be my my excellent, yeah. excellent. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Our time is off for now. I'm very grateful for all participants, and um, and of course the Saint Gallen University uh, Center for Governance and Culture. Um, um, Lund University and their library fund for providing the um, you know open access and the, um, I hope that you know our readers from Religion in Praxis blog as well as this podcast will enjoy that greatly and on this note um, uh, we are off for today thanks very much and all the best for, for the rest of the day thank you